Welcome back to Block TV, and this is Crypto Crunch. Now, as you all probably know, China has been the talk of the town for the last few weeks. Joining us to help break down the significance of the news coming out of a human, from this particular aspect as a human rights perspective, is Alex Gladstein, Chief Strategy Officer, the Human Rights Foundation. How are you, Alex? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for joining us, and I'm actually really eager to speak to you because I think a lot of the time when people talk about China, it either has to do with the price of Bitcoin um, or how they're winning in this arms race of technology and, and, and never really from this kind of angle. So I really do appreciate you being here. Now, recently you wrote an opinion that was published by Bitcoin Magazine with the headline, mm -hmm. it's China, it's blockchain and tyranny versus Bitcoin and freedom. Now, early on in the piece, you compare Xi Jinping's blockchain with the technology that helps power Bitcoin. Now, that is kind of a confusing uh, statement, I would say, right? Because how could they be different? So can you please break down what you mean by that? Yeah, I actually meant to contrast them. I meant to say that the technology that powers Bitcoin, which is an open, permissionless, censorship resistant uh, system, couldn't be any different from the system of surveil and control uh, and, and, and you know, individual level surveillance that Xi Jinping is going to try and set up, that he has already set up um, with the Communist Party in China. Uh, you have to keep in mind that from a human rights perspective, goal of the, the Communist Party is going to be to be able to control on a micro level the activities of citizens inside China as much as possible. And what Bitcoin specifically makes possible is the opposite of that is sovereignty and an escape from that system. Okay, and so then there's this breakdown of proof of authority versus the proof of work that we know. How is the use of proof of authority significant in this case? Well, I mean, if you think about who makes the decision to amend or add a new entry into a ledger? Um, historically, that's always required an, you know, an, an authority to make that decision, right? So for payment processing, you have someone like Visa or uh, a bank that would decide whether or not to add a new uh, ledger to them, a new transaction to the ledger history. Um, in Bitcoin, that process has been revolutionary, the revolutionarily decentralized, right? So you have a competition of people around the world uh, competing to to add um, transactions to the ledger history. Uh, and that's what makes censorship resistance really difficult because the miners and the people making the transactions aren't really known to one another. Uh, so there's no way to pick out transactions and say, you know, we want to stop transaction from person A to person B. Um, in, in any system that Xi Jinping will create, there will be no such uh, concession towards decentralization uh, or censorship resistance. In fact, the system will be built so that the uh, sensors or authorities in, in, within the banking system, whether it's at the central bank or elsewhere in the government, have total control and knowledge of every single transaction aided by artificial intelligence and increased um, big data analysis. They'll be able to in real time um, using advanced algorithms basically determine whether or not transactions should go through. So again, on the one hand, you have like this new uh, system of unprecedented social engineering and control, which is what Xi Jinping is trying to build with this new digital currency. And on the other hand, on the very, very far other end of the spectrum, uh, you, you have Bitcoin, which is uh, you know, actually decentralized censorship resistant money that is beyond the control of the Chinese government. Right, so ultimately taking the ideology behind the technology meant to give people more power, flipping that on people and then using it um, as a big brother mechanism, so to speak. Uh, what do you think China's, mm -hmm. and this may be silly, but what do you think China's goal is then with the creation of the digital yuan? Well, I mean, what I was trying to say in the article is that today they already, they're very close to this uh, panoptical surveillance anyway, uh, but they have to do it through third parties. Like, you know, most uh, people um, in urban areas of China transact using an app like WeChat, where uh, and through one social media system, they do all for shopping and transactions. And then from there, uh, the government could go to that company and say, hey, we need the information on this particular person. But there's a little bit of a friction there. And the companies aren't completely subservient to the government, contrary to maybe what you believe. There is a little bit of a back and forth there. So what would be way easier for the central government is if they had access to a ledger internally on their end that, that could allow them to see every transaction. That way they wouldn't have to go to a company like Tencent and ask them 
um, for information about a person. They would they would see it already. So that's that's really the goal of creating a, a kind of a new um, currency entirely. The the other key part of, of of doing this would be to eliminate cash entirely. And while cash is certainly more rare in, in, in urban China today than it was. Um, you know, a decade or two ago, of course, it still accounts for a significant percentage of general transactions in, in that country and in many other countries around the world, of course. So their goal is to literally get rid of all paper and metal money and replace it with something that's completely trackable. And that is certainly the dream of, of any dictator. Right. And that's, I mean, that's what people say, right? Cash is, is, does more harm Right. When you're talking about uh, the world and trying to get blocked in cryptocurrencies across, that's what you say. Cash does more harm. It's more anonymous. Governments should want to adopt it with that angle. And, and China was like, yeah, we got that. We're, we're going to do that with, you know, the negative aspect of it. So I don't know if you've heard about this, but discussing the weekend debacle that was the Binance, right, the exchange versus uh, the block uh, cryptocurrency publication, yeah. a lot of drama kind of uh, uh, surrounding that. The block claims that there was a raid on Binance's Shanghai offices. Binance mm -hmm. says no raid. There, there are no offices uh, as is. Dovi Wan, we spoke to her this morning, uh, who has become right the tweeter uh, with the crypto connection to China, denied that a raid occurred and, and then was also confused about po the police incentive uh, in conducting such a raid. She claims that there is no reason for them to walk into those offices. So let's take a look at what she says and then I'll ask you a devil's advocate question that you will likely hate. And also you have to understand <coughs> like, the incentive of like, Chinese police. Why Chinese police, like, they are incentivized to like, go after all this scam, currency, and then all that because they can confiscate all the money that this, like, scammy project that have, so, like, they have, like, defraud, right? And then, so, like, usually it's a gigantic amount of money. Like, they can confiscate, and then, so, which means that the money going to belong to, like, the police itself, and then, so, they, so, so that is actually their performance, and so they can pay themselves, like, high bonuses, right? So she's describing this sort of incentive, right, for, for police to even go in and raid. So I'm asking you, could, could this do away with the digital yuan? Could it do away with negative practices such as Dovi is describing here? Um, I think, look, the, the, the big picture with regard to this uh, little controversy is the, is, is, is the following. Um, the Chinese government wants blockchain. They don't want Bitcoin or even any other other cryptocurrencies. The reason why you're going to see a crackdown, and you've seen a crackdown over the last few years on cryptocurrencies, and specifically on Bitcoin, is because the Chinese government can't control Bitcoin. Um, sure, they can use it just like anyone else, but they don't have special privilege over it, which makes them not uh, a fan, right? It makes them against it. Um, however, they do want to create something that they do control, that they do have special privilege over, and they can use this buzzword called blockchain to put lipstick on this panoptical pig and create this new currency and pitch everybody to it as something that's more safe and more stable and more secure. And that's what they're going to do. But at the end of the day, they'll have a backdoor into your wallet. So with their new quote unquote blockchain system, um, they'll be able to control your money. Your money won't be your money. It'll be their money. So they'll have total control over it. They'll see where it goes. And as they get rid of cash entirely, there will be very little um, wiggle room for you to do anything that is not completely approved by um, the Chinese government. Um, Bitcoin is, is a huge problem for them because it ruins their plans. It is a digital currency that they cannot control um, that is beyond their uh, you know, micro surveillance and is likely to get more difficult to control. So I guess the solace um, or the little um, kind of silver lining for, for human rights activists uh, or anyone who's, who's trying to push back against injustice would be that Bitcoin will always exist and it'll always be an option. And even with peer-to-peer -peer trading, you'll always be able to access it. So even in the most Orwellian circumstance, I could still meet up with someone in China and invite them over to my place and they could help me with homework or something, right? And I could then pay them with this digital currency and I could just write, oh, it was for homework. But on the side, they're sending me Bitcoin, right? And the Chinese government doesn't know about it. So I think there'll always be a way for us to have this sort of parallel economy in Bitcoin. And that's why at the end of the day, I was kind of long-term a little bit optimistic because I, I think this is something that will, at the end of the day, kind of fluster their, their plans, which are 
which are not to be cheered, cheered on, which are cruel and, and which only serve a purpose of ultimate social control. And if you, if you want to know where that leads, if you want to know what happens when you have absolute power, you should look at what's happening in Northwestern China right now, where the Chinese Communist Party, um, in the situation where they have the most control over a certain population, the Muslim minority Uyghurs, you know, they have them in a, in a police state with concentration camps. So that's not what we want. And um, I think that ultimately, um, controlled, centralized, surveilled digital currency makes us sheep and then makes us slaves. And Bitcoin is a way to escape that. So it's not going to be something the Chinese government uh, wants to see. It's going to be something they try to attack as aggressively as possible. But ultimately, I'm not sure if they'll be successful there. So that gives us a little hope. Okay, so there is that little silver lining. Now, you you yeah. have over and over brought up this first-hand, real-time understanding, right, about the flow of money, and, and that's kind of their armor here, and that's the yes. reason that the digital yuan, um, it, you know, is even a factor in, in, in why it's being built. But I'm curious, uh, in a more practical sense, how this can affect people, as in why is this something that we should fear? I know you brought up a lot of examples on control, but in a more practical day-to-day -day setting, why is this dangerous? Well, everything is shades of gray and it's, it's, it's a slow transition. It's like a frog boiling in water. Um, if you're using WeChat today, you've already given up your, your financial privacy. The thing is you've given it up to Tencent. Now, it, you know, Tencent doesn't just real time stream all of your information to the Chinese government, right? They have to, <clears throat> there have to be like an injunction that the Chinese government have to come and ask for that information. And although they'd likely get it, there is like a, there is very much a back and forth there. This breaks down that final wall. And if everybody's literally using, while they're making payments, if they're using a surveillance mechanism, you know, if the money itself is the surveillance mechanism, then they've really reached that like kind of uh, final stage of being able to micro control your life. Um, and if you look at the history of this, when everybody used pay paper money and metal money and bare assets, the government had a really hard time figuring out what people were doing. People had privacy. Um, then you went to like credit cards, right? And, and plastic cards for money, right? So this was um, a little bit easier for the government to see, but still difficult because in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, they didn't have like big data analysis or AI possible to start, start to like link together um, you as a digital kind of uh, footprint. Um, it, it took a little more technological advancement, but now as we're getting to uh, a time in an age where not only are they going to have something better than a credit card, they're going to have the money itself be the, the surveillance mechanism, but they also in China and elsewhere have the AI slash sort of big data analysis to actually understand what each transaction means and start to get an ability to actually predict what you're going to do in the future. Um, this is where it gets like very terrifying. And this is where you actually start to see um, kind of a lot of this like uh, Orwellian 1984 um, dystopia start to actually play out. So um, cash is, is an effective bulwark against this kind of surveillance. And eventually when cash disappears, Bitcoin will be um, <clears throat> the bulwark. And you're, you're kind of seeing this today in Hong Kong, I would say there are some human rights groups and journalist groups who, who are having their bank account shut down and they're having their financial activity monitored. So some of them are starting to switch to receiving donations in Bitcoin and it allows them again to like escape from that system, escape from that system of control. And there's very little the authorities can do about it. So to me, it's like a very effective uh, safeguard against authoritarianism. Okay, and, and this is, this may not have an answer, but what can, you know, that's a hefty sum, all of what you just said. What can yeah. we do, if anything at all, or what responsibility, again, if at all, do we have as a society, as a global, is this global society to stop the harm that this can inflict? Yeah, well, I, I think that um, it's all about education. Such a tiny fraction of the world understands this new technology that allows people to have financial sovereignty and financial privacy and allows them to have a parallel economy and, and, and allows them to have an escape valve and allows them to put their time and energy into an asset that can't be confiscated and devalued um, by someone else. Um, so the best thing we can do is just kind of spread the word. So that's what I'm trying to do with, with my work, um, uh, both at the Human Rights Foundation and at Singularity University and uh, as an author with the Little Bitcoin book, 
we've been trying to spread the word and try to get people curious about this new technology called Bitcoin that will allow them to kind of uh, protect themselves a little bit in this increasingly digital age. So I think the moral imperative here is just to um, spread the word as much as we can um, and be available to answer questions and, and help people kind of like on ramp onto this, onto this new kind of uh, um, protection mechanism. And at the same time, we should be very um, focused on spreading the word about this, the increasing surveillance state, not just with regard to our communications and our whereabouts, um, but also with regard to our transactions. Absolutely. People can't make an educated decision of, of a viable alternative if, if they don't know about it. And, and I Correct. think that that's the big struggle. And then there's also the chicken and the egg issue of who provides this education is this government funded education uh, what kind well, of education? It won't be, governments won't be paying anything to educate the people about bitcoin so it's going to have to come from us the people so there you have it we have to spread the word thank you very much alex for joining us and breaking that down and good Thanks. luck it's been a pleasure. uh on the fight for all you folks at home watching at blocktv.com keep on watching for more crypto and blockchain news For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.